Coming up today, 19 hours and counting. Talks between the two Koreas go through the night as they look to thrash out the details of planned reunions for families separated by the Korean War. The National Assembly is due to vote on some key pending issues this afternoon, including the confirmation of a Supreme Court justice nominee and last year's budget settlement. First faced with intense public pressure, Britain pledges to take in 20,000 Syrian refugees by 2020. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello and welcome. It's 6 a.m. on Tuesday, September 8th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to our early morning edition of Arirang News. Our top story this morning, the two Koreas have been locked in negotiations since Monday morning at the border village of Panmunjom as they try to set the date, location and scale of a planned set of family reunions. The resumption of reunions for war-separated families was one of the key agreements reached during last month's high-level talks between the two Koreas. For more, let's go live to our Hwang Sang-hee at the Unification Ministry in Seoul. sang -hee, the talks aren't over yet. No, Mark, not yet. The Red Cross working level talks between the two Koreas began Monday morning, so the negotiations have practically stretched into the next day. Up for discussion are the location, date, and scale of the event. The reunions are most likely to be held early or mid-October following Chuseok, which is Korea's Thanksgiving holiday at North Korea's Mount Kumgang Resort. This is where the last family reunions were held in February of 2014. The event is expected to be held in two rounds, allowing around 100 family members from each side to meet their loved ones. The most contentious point of the talks might be South Korea's proposal to make the reunion a regular event. It's also expected to have proposed exchanging a list of surviving family members from both sides and also making video messages. The issue of war separated families is highly emotive and one of the most pressing humanitarian issues in Korea as millions of families have not seen each other since the Korean War in the 1950s. And time is definitely running out as nearly half of the 130,000 registered divided family members in the South have already passed away. Now, once the two Koreas reach an agreement, the South Korean chief delegate is expected to speak to the reporters here at the Unification Ministry. So I'll hopefully have more updates for you in our later newscast. This has been Hwang Sang-hee reporting live from South Korea's Unification Ministry. The top nuclear envoys of South Korea and China have been holding talks in Seoul on ways to get North Korea back to the negotiating table. South Korea's foreign ministry says Seoul's deputy envoy to the six-party talks, Kim Gon, and his Chinese counterpart agreed to make joint efforts to make positive progress in regards to denuclearization. The envoys also agreed to emphasize the importance of implementing the September 19 joint statement, which prohibits Pyongyang from carrying out nuclear and ballistic missile tests. Now, South Korea's chief nuclear envoy, Hwang jung guk plans to visit Washington later this month for talks with his American counterpart, Sung Kim. The head of the UN's nuclear agency says North Korea appears to be expanding its nuclear program and its main nuclear site. Speaking at a regular board meeting of the International Atomic Energy Agency on Monday, Director General Yukia Amano said, Recent satellite imagery indicates the North has been renovating and building at its Yongbyon nuclear facility. Now, he did not specify which parts of the site were being worked on, though. The IAEA chief also noted that a uranium enrichment plant at the site has almost doubled in size over the last 12 months, although it's not known whether it's operational. He said the satellite photos appear to be broadly consistent with Pyongyang's claims that it is further developing its nuclear capabilities. Lawmakers at the National Assembly will hold a plenary session this afternoon to deal with a number of key pending issues. Agenda items include a vote on Supreme Court Justice nominee Iki Tech, and that's expected to pass as the ruling Senate party, which holds a parliamentary majority, is in favour of that move. Lawmakers are also expected to approve the government's budget settlement for last year. 
During the, se the session, Korea's two main rival parties will attempt to handle some of the bills related to the people's livelihood that have been gathering dust, really, at the Assembly's Legislation and Judiciary Committee. The move comes after the floor leaders of the two main parties agreed to open a plenary session during a meeting on Monday. And Korea's rival parties have also agreed to form a consultative body with the government next month to discuss the pros and cons of a proposed free trade agreement with China, but with some strong opinions on both sides of this issue. The deal could be facing a drawn-out ratification process. Jimmy Young Gil reports. The ruling Henry Party and the main opposition party, the New Politics Alliance for Democracy, say they will work together for the smooth passage of the free trade agreement. The ruling bloc welcomed the formation of the three-way consultative body and highlighted that if approved, the FTA would also have a ripple effect on North Korea's economy. If the South Korea-China FTA is approved, a boost in trade between the two countries may render positive effects for the North Korean economy as well. It can also help stabilize the Korean peninsula and even help solve North Korea's nuclear arms program. The ruling bloc stressed that products manufactured at the Kaesong Industrial Complex will become more competitive as they will enjoy tariff reductions. With China being South Korea's number one export market, the ruling party says South Korean companies will achieve better access to China's domestic market. However, the main opposition MPD remains skeptical of the benefits an FTA between South Korea and China might bring. Will it be worth it when the FTA deal has practically left out the automobile sector? We must also consider the risk factors of China's economy and must discuss environmental issues like the Chinese yellow dust that Seoul suffers every year. The MPD added that South Korean automobile companies are little affected by the tariffs as most manufacture cars in China. The opposition bloc also claimed that since April, China had already given tariff reductions to its trade partners, highlighting that there is very little benefit in having this FTA with China. Kim young Arirang News. Now, search and rescue operations are stepping up a notch again as the sun rises this morning off the southern coast of Korea. Eight people remain unaccounted for after their chartered fishing boat capsized on Saturday evening, with 10 people already confirmed dead and hope fading for the missing. Some serious questions are being asked about how the accident occurred and the authorities' response to it. Shin Semin reports. Officials are scrambling to find the missing people who were on board the dolphin fishing boat that capsized on Saturday. A total of 72 boats, including Navy vessels, patrol ships, civilian fishing boats, and four aircrafts were mobilized to search for the eight passengers still unaccounted for. Considering that three days have passed, and with only a few victims recovered near all coastal areas of Chuja Island so far, we have designated three different locations as search regions. The boat with 21 fishermen on board lost communication on Saturday evening and was found Sunday morning near Chuja Island, north of Jeju Island. So far, three people have survived and 10 confirmed dead. The total number of passengers is down from the initial estimate of 22, which was based on the ship's passenger list. The Coast Guard said the capsizing of the boat may have been caused by high waves, an investigation based on the testimonies of three survivors. Officials are also planning to launch a probe to determine if the boat complied with safety regulations. President Park Geun-hye ordered the Public Safety and Security Ministry to do everything possible to search for the missing and ordered those in charge to provide accurate information on the accident. But Coast Guard officials say that after being notified of the boat's distress, the safety center was unable to confirm the boat's location within the so-called golden time and tried contacting those on the boarding list by phone. Although the Coast Guard eventually dispatched a rescue crew, it was sent to the wrong area, misjudging the location of the ship, costing valuable time and perhaps precious lives, evoking memories of last year's Sewolho ferry tragedy. Shin Semin, Arirang News. 
British Prime Minister David Cameron has pledged that the UK will resettle 20,000 Syrian refugees over the next five years in response to the intensifying refugee crisis. Speaking in the House of Commons on Monday, Cameron said that the scale of the crisis meant it was time for Britain to do much more. Laying out the criteria, Cameron said that only refugees from camps in their home regions would be taken in, not those who have already made the dangerous journey across the Mediterranean Sea into Europe. He also said refugees will be selected under established UN procedures and will be given five-year humanitarian protection visas. Britain's pledge came as France said it was ready to take in 24,000 people. Now, the El Nino brewing in the Pacific Ocean is getting really big. With equatorial waters significantly warmer than average, researchers are predicting that this El Nino could be among the strongest since records began in 1950. And for more on how this could bring some really wild weather, our Iji Wan reports. This is a satellite image of the water temperature distribution of the Pacific Ocean. The red and white areas show an abnormal increase in temperature, signaling the return of the weather phenomenon known as El Nino. El Nino is caused by strong winds from the west, blowing warm water towards the center and eastern sides of the Pacific. According to the World Meteorological Organization, water temperatures have been rising since July. With the ocean already 2 degrees Celsius warmer than average, we are only a 0.5 degree away from experiencing a more powerful form of the phenomenon, dubbed Super El Nino. Considering that water temperatures in the region peak in the winter, there's a high chance we'll see a Super El Nino this season. If a Super El Nino does happen, extreme weather conditions are expected to affect the world, causing scorching heat, severe droughts, and forest fires. The most recent Super El Nino was recorded in the winter of 1997 to 98. Korea was hit by abnormally mild temperatures that year and one of the most severe rainstorms the following summer. Meteorologists expect that with El Nino building up in the Pacific, in addition to the ongoing global warming, temperatures will hit new highs next year. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, thanks to advancements in high-speed internet and smart devices, viral marketing is gaining popularity at a rapid pace. And more and more Korean companies are turning to it to boost their business and to create buzz about their new products. Kwon Soa reports. 1.5 million bottles of this new citron-flavored soju flew off the shelves the month after its release. The popularity of this latest twist on Korea's trademark alcoholic beverage was all thanks to consumers who shared their experience tasting the drink on social media. Makers of this type of distilled drink often face tough ad restrictions, but advertising through SNS has turned out to be a perfect alternative. It's not only big companies that are cashing in from viral marketing. Francesco Nar, an overseas food sales manager, is losing sleep these days due to non-stop orders of an organic cabbage soup he sells. One of his customers lost around 5 kilograms in a week and posted the results on Facebook. The news spread fast. Within a month, we had over 1,000 cabbage soup customers. What is more interesting, uh, that is not me marketing the cabbage soup, but my Facebook friends that are selling it. Experts say this type of marketing can reduce advertising costs to a fraction of the bill for conventional ads. And to speed things up, there are even people who act as mediators, like this beauty blogger. Cosmetic brands ask her to use their products for free, even paying her to blog about them. Since consumers can't try out all the products and colors out there, I do it for them. Blogs are very personal, so bloggers give out information about the good and bad aspects of a product, and that's why people trust them. But some say that trust could be taken advantage of, leading to false and exaggerated posts that stretch the truth. I think TV ads are more reliable because they verify products and a lot is invested to make them. 
TV에서도 어느 정도는 Rules on the use of visuals and other effects for TV ads are set by a broadcasting ethics committee. A similar system is needed for online marketing. Once that's fulfilled, experts say with social media extending its global reach, it's likely Korea's viral marketing style will go viral too. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Well, that's all we have for now. I'm Mark Broom. Have a great day and thank you as always for watching. We do hope to see you at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.